Okay, my name is Ron Carrico, and with the San Diego Air and Space Museum. Today is the 7th of May, 2013, and we're going to be interviewing uh, Dean Laird, or Diz Laird, and who was a World War II pilot, and has, well, frankly, a very extensive career in military aviation, some uh, 30 years. And we're going to talk about uh, the, how he became an ace and the combat missions he flew, and then we'll go on to a few other subjects and see where it goes from there. Anyway, um, Captain Laird, still a captain, I guess? Commander. Commander, okay. <laughs> you joined the U.S. Navy in what year? I joined December 1941. Why did you join? Well, I was thinking about joining the Army Air Corps anyway. And I was, but I also wanted to go back to college. I only had two years of college. Well, well you so you joined, and did you become intend to become a, a naval aviator right away, or was that your intention? Uh, there was a friend of mine who came down, and and uh, he was working up on Donner Summit. Came down one day, and he says uh, the war had just started with the Japanese, and. Uh, he says, Dean, let's go down and join the Navy. And I said, well, I'm, I'm almost, I have done everything except sign the papers to go into the Army Air Corps. And so I said, why, why the Navy? And he said, well, he said, I've been thinking, you know, the Army has those, those P-40s and P-38s, and he says, they're all really hot airplanes. And he says, I, he says, you know, I have a heart problem. And he says, I don't think the Navy's airplanes are, are as, as fast and as maneuverable as those Army Air Corps birds. And he says, I, I, I think maybe I can handle those. And he did have a heart problem. In high school, I made him quit athletics. He'd, he'd well, sometimes he'd just collapse walking down the street. But, I said, well, it doesn't matter to me. I, you know, I, I already had a pilot's license, and I'm, I'm going to go into one or the other. And so, how did you end up in Hellcats or uh, Wildcats? Well, I got through flight training. Uh, I left Miami, which was the last training base. I was ordered to, to Fire Squadron 41 which was part of Air Group 4, and 41 it used, to be, it used to be fighting 4, but they divided it into 2 and became 41 and 42. 42 went off, I think, on the Wasp or something and went to the Pacific. 41 stayed with Air Group 4, and of course in those days, you know, the the air groups were numbered for the carriers that they were supposed to be on. And uh, like Air Group 4 was was a Ranger air group. It was uh, CV-4. Uh, air Group 3 was the Saratoga group and so on. And uh, so uh, I just, I got orders to Fighting four, and they had wildcats. Well, almost all squadrons had wildcats in those days. In fact, the only it, so so you're with VF four flying the wildcat. Now, did you participate in, in Operation Torch off of North Africa? No, no. They had the the. I had joined the squadron just after they came back. Okay, so then, but then you went off to. Yeah. Well, not exactly England, some island off of the north of the north part well, of England. We we deployed, we deployed first. We went up and we operated out of Argentia for Newfoundland for a couple of months, and then they sent us over to Great Britain, and we we went into Scapa Flow which is in the Orkney Islands, uh, north of Scotland. And 
Was that, a, was that island uninhabited? The Orkneys? Uh, yeah, that's... Oh, no. Okay. Oh, no, they had... Uh, uh, the air base we were at was a Royal Naval Air Station, Hatston. was uh, had quite a city there. Uh, starts with a K, whatever. But the, and you operated off the base. You didn't operate off the carrier then. When the ship was in port or in in the flow anchored, we we flew off and went in, went into the this uh, Royal Naval Air Station. And I uh, and we so it's, it's we just did a lot of training from from the base from the beach there, and then uh, when the fleet would go out, we'd take off and fly out and land aboard and go do whatever we're going to do. Now, at that time, now, so you apparently had radar vectoring available. Yes. And so you were flying some sort of combat patrols. You were armed and all that. Yes, I, I was on for Operation Leader, which was the only operation we did over there. And, and uh, as far as I was concerned, we it was a big waste of time. I, I wanted to be out in the Pacific anyway, but uh, we, we, we didn't accomplish a hell of a lot. Operation Leader was shot on a oh, sink. I didn't, with the, our bombers and torpedo planes. Sank six or eight German ships who were going up and down the Norwegian coast, and uh, we only saw two airplanes the whole time we were over there. So, now the, so you, saw the, you saw the two airplanes, and you and your wingman, I guess, uh, shot them down. How far away they were from the coast, and what were they doing? Well, they apparently knew where, where our fleet was, and uh, but they weren't getting in very close. And uh, the Ju-88, which we eventually found, we were vectored out for it, and the weather was. Pretty, pretty miserable. North Atlantic, yeah. <laughs> many, many clouds, and visibility not very good. And we've wrecked around all over the place, looking for uh, this this bogey, and we couldn't find it. And finally, they vectored us back to the to the uh, fleet. And I knew the the. Radar control officer, and, and I, I knew that if he, if he said something was out there, you could bet your bottom buck that there was something there. So, as we were vectored back, I was flying the number four position in the formation, which, on the way back, the formation became a <laughs> like this. I, I couldn't keep up with with, with anybody. I don't know why the airplane just didn't have the poop. And, um, what kind of speed do you think you were going? Oh, 250? Well, a true airspeed was probably around 300. Okay. But I was, uh, I kept looking back. I, I didn't have to worry about running into anybody. And I kept looking back because I knew that there had to be something back there. And sure enough, uh, out from behind a big cloud, I saw this, this uh, airplane come out. And I hollered tally-ho, six o'clock. And with that, uh, Boyd Mayhew, who was, who was my section leader, turned, I turned with him. And, and we headed back, and by the time we got turned around, I, I kept watching this guy, and he went all the way around this cloud and went around behind it on the other the other side. I told Boyd what I saw, where he, where he had gone, and, and Boyd headed over to the side from which he had emerged, <coughs> and I'm right behind him, We, and sure enough, here he came, and we... He probably saw us about the same time we saw him. Uh, we had had little altitude advantage on him, 
and he turned headed away from us. Well, I think that J of 88 was, uh, was just about as fast as we were. And we had a heck of a time catching him. And, and uh, Boyd took a position on his heading for his right, and I went over on his left. And uh, Boyd made a, started a run on in him, and when he was about halfway through it, I started my run in. And <clears throat> we had him smoking after the first run, and I had recovered back up to this position, and Boyd was up here, trying to get back into a good position again. And, and Boyd came in, and I came in, and, and we, he was smoking pretty badly. And I'm about the middle of my firing run when he just exploded in a big ball of flame and just, just disappeared. So you had, uh, the Wildcat had four fifty calibers? Six. Six, okay, well that'll do it. And what was the firing range? <clears throat> we normally tried to fire at a, at a thousand feet. Oh, that far, wow. Now, so what kind of target practice had you been doing before? Had you had extensive amount of aerial, aerial gunnery before that? Oh, that's, that's almost all we did was air-to-air -air gunnery. And, uh, <clears throat> How many hours do you think you had at the time? By then, let's see, well, I had about 164 hours when I got out of flight training, and I was probably getting See another twelve. I probably had another close to three hundred hours. So total four hundred and fifty okay. hours. So you were like you were very highly well, you were pretty highly experienced for that period of time. Uh yeah, I didn't feel like I was because I hadn't had any actual combat. So now the now now this is was it on the same flight when you when you guys got the Heinkel? Yes. Uh, after we shot the, the the 88 down, they vectored us back to the fleet and immediately gave us another vector out in the opposite direction. And we the leader has got his hand in the carburetor again and and they're spread out like this. Our vector took us right toward what looked like a, a, a big gun. And, <clears throat> and the leader turned and paralleled it. And everybody followed him. And I got up there and this is a side note. I had I had 2010 vision. I had the best vision of anybody in the squadron, and I got up there and I just turned and I saw this shadow, only maybe 25 feet off the water, in the rain squall, heading in the opposite direction. I called Tally Hall again and and everybody piled in there into the, into the rain squall. And I immediately lost sight of, of the other three <clears throat> and dropped down to about 10 feet off the water so I could stay VFR. And I'm flying along there full throttle and all of a sudden um, I, I see this airplane coming at me just well, maybe 30, 40 feet above me. And it was about 11 o'clock, and all I had time to do was pull up, pull the trigger, and I went past him like that. And I, I, I did see parts coming out of his, I hit his, his left uh, f float, which was right below the left engine, and pieces flew off that. I don't know if it hit the engine or not. That's what I was trying to hit, but. <clears throat> By the time I got turned around, he was, of course, he was well out of my range again, and I, uh, I found out later that the other three 
apparently had gotten a shot at him, and as uh, uh, Boyd Mayhew had a, a picture of him, uh, pretty much a 90 degree shot. Um, this picture right here. Yes. And <coughs> the other two didn't have any pictures, but um, they, uh, and he turned and these guys, I guess they didn't get turned around very fast. As, uh, I was in, I ended up in the, in the lead and I, and I never did, I say, I never did see them until about, uh, after I followed this guy and I got up close to it in range and I, I just pulled up and gave him a, a shot over, over him, figuring out maybe I could lob some in there. I figured I was out at least 1,500 feet by then in, in range. <coughs> and right out, I don't know if I hit him or not. Right after that, he started down, and uh, he tried to land in the water. And when he did, that, that port float of his collapsed, and he he cartwheeled, and all the all the guys were thrown out of the airplane. But both of these things happened within oh, I'd say fifteen minutes of each other. How far were you off the coast? We were about a hundred miles off. And neither neither the n neither crew that were shot down were ever recovered. I don't I think these these two were out there obviously they were looking for the, for our fleet. And, and I think the date was October October third, okay. Forty three. Because you, you came home right after that. I mean, the ship sailed and you went home. We came home. We started home in November. In fact, we we spent Thanksgiving in uh, in Reykjavik on the way home. And we got home on, I think, the 3rd of December. So when your flight got back, you'll have to excuse me. I use, NA I use Air, uh, Air Force terms. You know, I refer to flights and you refer to sections. And... <laughs> Why is all right? Well, you were in the Air Force too, so. <laughs> but um, uh, what would, what would, there must have been a big celebration when you got back aboard ship after downing two enemy airplanes. Um, I don't. I don't recall anybody celebrating. All, the only thing I recall is that that uh, uh, I was censured because I had fired so much ammunition. You're kidding. No, I'm not. How many rounds? I don't know. I, I, I shot maybe 600 rounds. <laughs> so were you more careful after that? <laughs> <laughs> so, you, so now you come back to the States, uh, and at this point, this is when you, did you transition right away into the Hellcat then? No, first they took away our F4F Wildcats and they gave us FM2 Wildcats. FM2 looked just like uh, the F4F with a few modest changes. It had a little higher tail on it and uh, it only had four 450s instead of six. And, uh, what, was, what, was the, what were the flying characters? I, I, you know, at our air museum, we have a Hellcat that's sitting up in the air, and someone told me they had to crank the gear up by hand. Is that right? In the Wildcat, you did. Wildcat, right. Yeah. Um, that must have yeah, been a... 28 turns. And try to fly formation at the same time. <laughs> you, could, you could tell when people were putting their gear up, you took, if you had a four-plane formation taken off together, and the leader would start his gear, and everybody else, you could tell they were cranking, because they held on the stick with their left hand and, and cranking this way, and, and the airplane is going like that. So, so that, so the, now when, the, when you did transition to the Hellcat though, was that a huge jump in performance? Uh, yeah, although it, it wasn't 
so much of a jump from the FM2. The FM2 was uh, wider, had a little more horsepower, had a different engine, it had a right nine cylinder right in it, what was it, about a 1360 or 1320, something like that. The, the, the F4F had, had a Pratt & Whitney um, uh, 14 cylinder engine in it, which put out about 1200 horsepower. Two, two stage uh, supercharging or? Yeah, they were all supercharged. With the correct puck in, in the Wildcat, were they pressurized cockpits? Oh, no, no. So your ceiling was? Well, we would, we, we would go up to 30,000 or more. And it had to deal with that pressure breathing all the time. Yeah. Oh. Hmm. So now, you, so now when you trained to transition to the Hellcat, where did you do that? Well, we, uh, they gave us our Hellcats at, uh, at Quonset Point, Rhode Island. And we flew them up to Ayer, Massachusetts, which is at Fort Devens, about 30 miles west of Boston. And uh, the field at Ayer was adequate, about, I guess, about five, most. I think one runway was only about 4,000 feet, but the others were five or so. And uh, <clears throat> we trained there, we were there for about two, maybe a little over two months. And it all air to air? Everything is air to air combat, your training? Um, we, would, we would tow our targets out over the, over the ocean do our air-to-air -air gunnery out there, tow the targets back. And dogfighting in between? Dogfighting air-to-air -air in between, I mean? Well, no, not usually. If we do doing any, any, uh, if we don't do anything tact tactics-wise, we, we would schedule it as a tactics flight and and go out and do that type of stuff. Well, when you did it, okay, when you did a tactics flight, did you, was it four on four, two on two, single ship? Well. Single plane? Usually it was two on two. Uh, of course, once in a while we'd, we'd schedule a one on one just so guys would, would uh, realize what they had to do to, to beat beat the other guy without getting yourself shot down. Uh, okay, well, so what, what, what do you, what would you, well, let's give a typical example. How would you set up on a one-on-one? -on -one? Well, we usually started with, <laughs> say, uh, base flight, 5,000 feet. The attacker would be at 7,000, usually a 2,000 foot altitude advantage. 1500 to 2000 and you the battle would start when you when you passed each other and then of course the guy with the advantage if if he lost he was a dead duck you know um, <clears throat> normally well I know in in I was pretty good at dog fighting um, I I never lost a, a fight when I was had the advantage, and I don't recall ever losing one when I was at the disadvantage. Well, to give give us a typical example. You come you you, you cross a beam of each other, and then one guy goes up, one guy goes down. And uh, yeah, I normally if I had two thousand foot altitude advantage, I usually tried to do to do an overhead run on him. And, okay. and of course he'd, he'd start turning and climbing at the same time and <clears throat> you may not get a shot at him, you might have to go around and, and, and come, come back because uh, you'd overshoot if he was smart enough and turned enough. But um, it was, and then you're just, 
who who could turn the damned airplane the tightest from then on. And, uh, and the guy that could would eventually end up on the tail of the other guy. Did you, uh, did you maintain your speed above everything else, or did you drop your flaps in situations? Uh, the only time I, I gave away any speed was to get altitude. And the only time I gave away any altitude was to get speed. And you could trade one for the other. Yeah, energy and maneuverability, they called that back in the 60s. <laughs> called it what? I said they called it energy maneuverability oh, back yes. in the 60s, oh, okay. yeah. Trading energy and yeah. altitude for airspeed. Yeah. So you got plenty of combat experience, I mean, Simulated experience. How do you do a two-on-two -on -two situation? Uh, well, um, usually we practiced what we what was known as a thatch weave, and two guys would separate. And you'd fly. You're flying from here to there. You got your parallel um, about the distance it would take you to turn and get over here so that uh, you have some guys up here at, uh, that are attacking you're on defensive now you guys guys up here with advantage and they if they are attacking this guy what you do you both turn toward each other and and if they're attacking this guy this guy is shooting at him and then you turn and you go back this way. So the thatch weave was used if you're going to a situ going to a situation, and then you're traveling at a cruise speed of say 300 or so. Whatever you want to cruise at. And, and then the, the the turn radius would be 3,000 feet, maybe. Oh, maybe, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But did they stay with that same procedure throughout the entire? Because I know it was, I can't remember the guy's first name, but Thatch invented that. Yeah, Jimmy, they call him Jimmy, his name was John, Jimmy Thatch. He I, used to live right over here, about two blocks away. Oh, is that right? Well, how about that? And he was a few years older than you, I guess, wasn't he? Uh, yeah, he was probably four or five years older than me. <laughs> Because he's passed away by now, I suppose. Yes. Oh, he. And I went to Hilo, Hawaii. Yeah, we we went out. We went to Hilo. And it, was that aboard a carrier then? We went out on a we went out on a jeep carrier. They took our airplane. No, yeah, we took airplanes with us. We got some new airplanes. Brand new airplanes. No, they weren't new. They were. These were they were used, <coughs> and, and we used the hell out of them. They're in, in Hilo. Well, think about how many hours they probably had. A couple hundred hours on them at the most, something like that. Um, yeah, maybe more. But then, just before we left Hilo, they gave, gave us um, 36 brand spanking new Hellcats. Wow. And uh, How'd the Hellcat compare to the Wildcat? Well... The early Wildcat, not the FM2. It there really wasn't too much you could compare compare them with. The Hellcat, of course, was quite a bit heavier, about three thousand pounds heavier. Oh, really? But it had two thousand horse engine, and and it uh, was had a lot more capability. It had the same same firepower, but it could carry. Same gun sight? Um, same gun sight. And the gun sights in those days, as I recall, I mean, you don't read this anywhere, but I know at the museum we have some gun sights, and I was looking at them, and I finally figured out that you could set the range that you wanted to fire at, and then there was another ring to set the wingspan of the airplane. At least this was on one of the German or uh, uh, English airplanes. Well, <clears throat> Ours were not like that. Uh, we knew the wingspan of, of uh, 
the planes we were most likely to run into. And you had you had rings on because it, it reflected up on the windshield. Right, the reticle, yeah. The, and, yeah. Yeah. And and uh, at a thousand feet, which was what the range we tried to start firing at, <coughs> if the wingspan of an airplane was, would say, uh, 40 feet, it would cover 40 mils of that site. Okay. And when you got down to 40 mils, you knew where a thousand, thousand feet. And uh, of course, you had to figure out your own your own lead. And, and people don't realize how much lead you had to give an airplane. You know, you, you, if, you, if your target say was 180 knots, for instance, and you want to shoot at him at a thousand feet, well, 180 knots. This guy is traveling. Um, 260 feet a second. Three, 300 feet per second. Basically, yeah. Uh, 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 a knot, a knot is a little bit more than a yeah. mile per hour. So it, uh, and knots are easy, easier to figure because uh, 60 knots is 100, right. 100 miles an hour. So, <clears throat> If you've got a target out here at a thousand feet and you're aiming 300 feet ahead of him, that's a long damn way. And so you can't see him over the nose. Mm -hmm. You can't see him over the nose sometimes. I mean, your nose, your nose is going to be up this high. Well, I've never had that problem. We could get more, more than, more than. Uh, uh, that's why the nose slopes down, I guess. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but, I mean, you have to, you, you're shooting out there 300 feet ahead of this guy, and a lot of people just don't realize that, and they'll, they'll pull up and, you know, pull out here and say, boy, that ought to be plenty of lead, and your bullets are going back here. <laughs> so did... Uh... So then you deployed out of Hilo, and which carrier? Well, we went out again on a, on a jeep, loaded all our brand new airplanes on, on this jeep carrier, and instantly we, we each had our own airplane, which we were responsible for. We hardly ever got to fly it, but inspecting it you know, periodically, and you know, and we waxed them. We hand waxed those things. Okay. Every one. We, we found we could get 10 to 15 knots more speed out of them if they were waxed. Wow. And so, well, we really worked on them. And we finally got to, to Saipan. And they dumped us off in the, in the big carrier on the uh, um, Bunker Hill. Pulled in. Our CO went on board with and talked to the captain and and told him, you know, we've got uh, 36 brand new Hellcats here. And we're, we'll get a barge and barge them out and hoist them aboard. And, and the captain says, no, you won't. He says, I got all the Hellcats you need right here on this ship. But we had to leave our brand new birds there. And we took all these war weary ones that, that I think two other squadrons had already used by the time we got there. And so uh, let me ask you about that. Did you did you have G meters in the airplanes? Yeah, what? G meters? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. What kind of what were the G limitations? Well, the max G's, as I recall, on the Hellcat was about nine G. That's what they said. You you shouldn't pull more than nine. No, you were and you were you had G suits by then. Yeah, we had G suits. Pretty much the same thing as they had in the sixties, the bladders and all that stuff. Yeah. Did you have in the Wildcats as well? Uh, yes, and we 
I, mean, I know I, I pulled nine G's many times in the World Cup. Really? Although it probably wasn't a smart move. I, I, uh, I watched two of my friends pull wing off in a gunnery run. Really? And that, that's kind of hazardous to your health. I can't, well, it seems like pulling a 9 G's in an airplane going 300 knots, it seems like it, you're, you'd lose so much airspeed just right now. No, not if you're going straight down. Well, yeah. It, you, it just, the stress, uh, the stress mounts up as your speed increases too. Right. The same for the same amount of G, and uh, I know I I I probably pulled G's so many times that I probably overstressed an airplane, and and didn't re I knew I was pulling a lot of G's, but I didn't realize uh, how close I was to killing myself either. Well, I don't think they uh, nowadays they can over G the airplane so fast that they. What do they call it? They call it G, G lock, G loss of consciousness, which can happen instantaneously if these guys fly in these hot rod airplanes. Yeah, board about a month, and they transferred us to the Essex. Did you fly over, or did you, or just leave your airplanes there? And no, we took over their old birds again. Oh, jeez. The, the Bunker Hill came home for a few repairs, and then came back again with a new air. So we're, you got on the Bunker Hill, and yeah, we where, went, did, where did you go? We went on the, joined the fleet in the Pacific and in, uh, in, the, in the Philippine Sea. And our first operation was <coughs> Lady Gulf. And so this would be in? That was about, um, what, 1st of October? Uh, yeah, September to uh, September to November '44. You were on the Bunker Hill, according to this. Yeah. And <clears throat> so, what were you? Do what was the mission? They had a whole raft of airplanes. We must have had six hundred Hellcats flying, and we were all up about twenty thousand feet. And we went in, and we circled around, and. Circled around and then flew back and landed. I didn't do a damn thing. I don't know what what we were supposed to be doing. Well, wasn't the idea to you have you have fighters, dive bombers, and torpedo bombers. torpedo bombers, and didn't you all kind of cooperate as one sort of unit? Well, yes. Uh, Sometimes they join up a, a couple of bomber squadrons together, a couple of torpedo bomber squadrons. Um, I went on um, several f fighter sweeps where we had 20 fighters or so from two or three or four squadrons on uh, ships. And, um, Going after ships or on land? No, we were, we were always all of our, all of ours were land targets. So were they assigned targets or were they targets of opportunity or? Um, the the major the major fighter sweeps were were uh, assigned targets. Okay, now when you say a fighter sweep, what? How do you give us a description of what, what you're going to do? How you you brief the flight as a flight of four, a four plane formation, or? We, well, uh, first fighter sweep I was on. We were on the bunker hill. There were eight of us, and we took off, went over the Philippines. Meandered around, up around Clark Field. Didn't see anything to shoot at. 
targets of opportunity. And finally we came down past this little dirt strip and I looked down and there's seven Tonys. That was an inline engine machine. Lined up getting ready to take off. And uh, the CO of the squadron was leading the sweep. And at that time, I was his second section leader. And uh, I called him and I said, KG, there's seven Tonys down there getting ready to take off. Should we go get them? And he says, KG was from Georgia or Alabama, Naval Academy graduate, 38. And he, he says, nah, Diz, he says, we'll just circle here and let them take off. So, well, we did, we circled. And we circled, and we circled. And there were shooting arrows on the ground. I got, I got a, two or three holes in my, in my airplane. We were about 8,000 feet. Big puffs going off all around us. And finally they started taking off and KG called and he says, okay, let's go get them. And so I figured he'd take the first one, his wingman would take the second one. And so I, I came down and I, I took the third one. He got off and I'm over here and I'm, even I gave him a 90 degree shot and he just burst into flame and but he turned and I, got, and, and I went past him going this way and I lost sight of him behind me and I used the speed to get up to altitude again and I looked around and my wingman was back there somewhere. I thought my wingman would take the fourth guy off but he didn't he stayed with me and so uh, I got up to, I don't know, six or seven thousand feet and, and I looked down and I saw another Tony coming a couple thousand feet below me. So I headed over and like this, and a split S, only this guy saw me and he was trying to climb and he was quite slow, and, but also that improved his turn radius and he, by the time I got down here, he'd already turned around and he was trying to get up to where he could shoot at me, but he couldn't without stalling. So I had a, not a too good a shot at him and I think I just, I, I probably shot behind him. I missed him. We went through that about three times and uh, it was about the third time I came around and I made sure that I, I got out here in front of him and I, I hit him and he, he just flipped over, went into a spin and went in. I think I probably hit the pilot because mm -hmm. he didn't, it didn't smoke, didn't burn or anything else. What kind of speeds were you when you first started the attack? What's, what kind of speed were you doing? Well, I was probably hitting about three... 300 or, or a little better, 350 in, this, in the dive. And I'd get back up to my altitude each time. And, and by the time I got back, he, he was able to turn that thing around. And, and I don't think he, he probably never got over uh, 100, 120 knots. When you, t when you took, what was the takeoff speed on a, on a Hellcat rolling down that? Well, I guess you took off a carrier. So the air, to get airborne, what were you doing? 80, 90? About... Uh, Airspeed, I should say. Well, if we're using a deck run, we we get off about about 80 knots, yeah. And then did you push the nose down to gain some speed before the water? Mm, no, you didn't. You only had about 85 feet to the water. Yeah, okay. Well. You, you don't push over to Yeah. Water. Um, well, you see pictures sometimes of the airplane disappearing off the nose of the carrier. That's probably because he just uh, is so heavy and his speed is marginal. What uh, Did you use full power on takeoff? 
for you. Because I, 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 I was imagine with the torque and the precession or what do you call it, the gyroscopic effect of the engine that you would have so much torque that it would be hard to... You, you got full right rudder on. Yeah, well, because I heard the Mustang pilots wouldn't use full power. They would, because they had a long runway, so why bother? But then coming across the top, so you're down, so you're coming out the bottom at 350, 300, 350, and around the top you're doing 70 or 80 as you're pulling over the top, something like that. Maybe, maybe 100 or so yeah. on the top. Yeah, I saw numbers like that in the F4 too, you know, just burbling like crazy and just staggering across the top of it, kind of going up and down. What's going on? Over the Philippines, you got two airplanes in one mission. Oh, uh, uh, yes. And, and uh, we all went back to the, well, one of the guys didn't take off, the last guy in that flight saw what was happening to his buddies and he jumped out and ran in the jungle. And uh, Somebody destroyed it on the ground. We got back to the ship and we're debriefing, and, and uh, my wingman verified both of mine, and and uh, nobody else had any verification. Nobody had a gun camera that worked. We had inherited all these damned old airplanes, and. Gun cameras didn't work. How many hours do you think the airplanes had on them at that time? Oh, I don't know how many cruisers they made. I know they made, they probably made at least two cruisers. And, and, uh, so they could be 1,500 hours, 1,000 hours, something like that? Oh, well, yeah, they could have 1,000 hours on them easily. Yeah. But, so, we got to, Totally, and I'm out. So what happened was we shot down six airplanes, destroyed one on the ground, and so we got totaling them all up, and and uh, they, uh, we we shot down seven. And I said to the AI officer, I said, hey, "No, that's not right." I said, "There were only six airplanes airborne." I said, "We didn't shoot down seven. We only shot down six. And he said, well, I, I don't know what to do about it. I said, well, somebody's lying. He said, yeah, but who? I said, I don't know. But we cannot claim seven when we only shot down six. I said, I said, I know what to do about it. I said, just give me credit for one and forget the other one. So, so I, I only got credit for one there. So now that was first one in in, uh, in in the Pacific. So now you've got well, you got three, four more, right? Uh, at least. <laughs> well, uh, so 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 that first part of the cruise, you hardly ever saw any enemy airplanes. Oh no, we didn't. I didn't see another airplane in the air until. Uh, I think it was January. And where were you then? We were in the South China Sea. So you're, you're, you're pressing, basically the fleet is going north. The fleet went... Around the Ark of the Islands or the Bismarck Sea, is that what it was called? No, they went in on, between on the, the Formosa Strait, north, north of Luzon mm -hmm. and into in the South China Sea. Well, most of the fleet, oh, we were getting, by this time, I, I had my own, my own flight then of four. And, <clears throat> and the schedules officer was a new guy. He was giving me these crummy goddamn flights. You know, like, um, Two plane search flight, go out 300 miles across, 100 miles and back and looking for ships. And maybe a, a subcap where you go out and 
flagged combat air patrol or on a rescue sub for three or four hours and then come home. And well, how long could you fly a, 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 a Hellcat? How long could you stay airborne in a Hellcat? Well, this, 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 the day I'm going to tell you about, I, we were airborne six hours. Ooh. And I was, I was the, this first flight we had there in the, in the South China Sea, I had, had to search and I, I stopped at the scheduled guy's chair and I said, Charlie, and I'm getting sick and tired of these goddamn <laughs> garbage type flights you've been giving me. And if I don't start getting my share of the fighter sweeps and the escort missions, then I'm going to punch you right in the mouth. <laughs> and I went out and managed my airplane and flew my search. And I got up the next morning and I had this terrible, terrible bellyache. I never had a pain like that before. Got up in the ready room and, God, I had a fighter sweep to Hainan Island, eight of us, CO division and my division. And uh, we, uh, and I thought, holy cow, with this bellyache, I shouldn't go. I know I shouldn't go, I ought to go to sick bay. But I said, there's no way I can go to Charlie and tell him I can't fly <laughs> after, after <laughs> I'm going to punch him in the mouth. <laughs> so I went on the flight. We got in there. We we passed two search planes going in. It had a an SB2C dive bomber and a and an, and oh a three plane two Hellcats escorting them. And we passed them going in. The weather was lousy. We were right on the deck all the way, and. Uh, we finally hit Hainan, and gee, it opened up pretty well, and the overcast was up about uh, oh, 12,000 feet, I guess. And so we climbed on up, and the, the island was completely obscured. But we climbed up, and we made a big circle around, and didn't see anything, and the CO started heading out. And he's got a division here, and I've got mine here. And and uh, I look down, and here comes a Zeke coming up toward us. And uh, I just I just pushed over right at him, and and fired, and didn't get didn't get a long burst out of him at all, very short, and and passed him, and. Uh, I, I, I turned right. I don't know why I thought he would go to left. And I turned right. Well, he turned right also and headed back towards Hainan, towards the island. By the time I got turned around, Jesus, I, I was way off. And the other guys were mostly in front of me by then because they were sitting up here and they were able to see what was going on. <coughs> and I, so I... I drove down and picked up as much speed as I could, and then I started passing these people and and getting up and and I'm up almost in range, and I, I'm looking up, and those I saw these three search planes that we had passed. They had come in, found this spot, and they had climbed up, and they were just under the the overcast, and a bunch of Jap fighters jumped on him from above, out of the overcast, shot down the SB-2C and one of the Hellcats almost immediately. And I saw this happen and I hollered, Tally, oh, the search planes are in trouble at 11 o'clock high. I said, go get him. I said, I'm, 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 I'll get this guy. And so <coughs> they all peeled off a little and I, Still after this guy, and I went and I couldn't seem to gain on him. 
I did get him, his gear finally fell down. I could shut out his hydraulic system. <coughs> but he was, he was, I just couldn't gain on him fast enough to suit me. So I figured he's, he's no longer a threat anyway. I'll go up and help the rest of them because they were milling around up there with a whole bunch of Jap birds. And I peeled off and I started climbing up and uh, had to go around and come back this way. And, and I look up and here comes a lone fighter who was a, um, what we called a hamp. It was the same as a Zeke. Only it had squared off wingtips and squared off tail. He was coming quite a ways above me. And so uh, I said, well, hell, I'll pick him off on the way. And I was, as he, as he, as he came in, I, I finally I pulled up. I had a 90 degree shot at him straight up this way. Pulled out here and got him some lead and fired. And, and he just nosed over, and I came up and I fell him down, and he just went straight down. No, no flame, no smoke, nothing. And so I fall, fell in behind him, and I, and I said, "Well, I'll just take a picture of him, and I'll I throttle way back, and so I'd lose some distance. I was right on his ass." And I didn't want to shoot anymore if I didn't have to. And I, I wanted to get enough distance that when he hit the water, I'd have enough room to pull out. <coughs> so, and, and I'd take a little picture of him every once in a while. And when he was about to hit the water, I held the, the camera down. So he hit the water and then I pulled out and got the hell out of there. And Where was your wingman? Hmm? What happened to your wingman? Oh, he was... When I sent them all off to uh, go help those search planes... Okay, he joined them. He went, he went with them. I said, you guys all go get them. And so then I went up and I was going to... A few minutes before, there was a whole bunch of guys up above me. And I look up and I, there's nobody there. <laughs> and so I headed back, I'm trying to climb up. And all of a sudden I see a Hellcat come out of, over quite a ways above me. And I, so I tried to catch up to him and I couldn't for a while. And, and then I saw this. Zeke come out of the overcast and he sat right on this guy's tail and just sh shot the hell out of him. But he was, he was so close, his wing guns, he never hit the fuselage. He, he hit both wings on both sides of the fuselage. He had a whole bunch of holes in it when it got back. And I just started Pulling up and shooting, hoping I could scare this guy off. And he finally, my, I just kept the trigger down. My guns had stopped. I'd kick the chargers and get them going again. <clears throat> you did you kick the what? The chargers, gun chargers. Oh. And they were right above the, the, uh, the rudder pedals. So, but the but the, so they somehow charged the hydraulically or mechanically because the guns are on the way. Hydraulically, they they charged the guns. So they just sort of, okay. Oh, just, well, never heard of that. Kick it once. Oh, well. had a little button like that for each one. Yeah. And and uh, I'd get them going again, and I, I finally got a little smoke coming out of it, and he broke off and pulled up into the overcast. And I finally got up and I got alongside this other Hellcat and finally it was my number four man. So I gave him a join up signal and, and headed out and finally caught up to the rest of the group. They had they had one of the other 
Hellcats in tow as or escorting him. He was covered with oil. He had no more oil left. He quit smoking and and, and um, our CO was, was on the radio calling the rescue sub, which was, was one in the area. And and finally the sub surfaced and we spotted him. And CO told this guy, he says, you better land by that sub. And he goes, well, I can, I, I, it's running pretty good now. I can probably make it back. He says, CO said, I don't think so. He said, we're, we're three hours from home. Oh, yeah. That's and a long time to run without oil. <laughs> so, uh, he said, you better land beside him. Which he did, and then we took off. That hour, that flight was six hours, and we got back. How did you find the ship? We had a system called YEZB, whatever those stood for, and it, it sent out a, a every 15 degrees uh, a different letter. It might be M, P, S, T, all the way around the compass. It was only in that sector. So, and you knew what it was, what the code was, and and uh, they changed it every day. <clears throat> so if you picked up a certain letter, you knew that what heading that would mm -hmm. take you back to the ship. And then when you got back to the ship, is it, did you come in, and that particular day you had two flights of four coming in, how many airplanes were recovering at the same time? Oh, well, you just fall in and one behind the other. And this actually, I was in such pain. <laughs> we, Which you probably forgot about for a while. <laughs> I'd been in such pain for six hours. I broke off and I told him I'm going to land, and I broke off and I went in and I made, I landed first. Right. I got down to the ready room and gave my debrief. I went to my room, climbed in my sack, and I didn't know what the hell to do. And then finally, I got on the phone and I called sick bay. And I got, a, and a doctor answered the phone. Fortunately, he was a doctor. I, had a doc, I got the worst damn belly ache I've ever had in my life. I said, could you send up a, a laxative and maybe I can get rid of this thing? He says, don't you take a thing. He says, I'll be up to your room and see you. What room are you in? I told him, 207. Well, he had a sick day way back there. He came all the way up there, put his hand around my belly and he says, got on the phone, he says, send up a litter. And I said, you don't need a letter, I can walk back there. And he said, no, you can't. And I said, two corpsmen showed up with a litter and they put me on it and carried me back, put me on a table and stabbed me in the back with a needle and cut my stomach open and pulled out a thing. He hold, held it up to me, I could see it. And the goddamn, uh, Appendix was about that big, but the color of your shirt. Oh, wow. He said, you're one of the luckiest guys I've ever known. Oh, wow. And you're really lucky. But that was, that, that was my longest flight. Seemed like a lot longer. Yeah, I'll bet. So now that would have been probably... That was about January... 45. 11, 12, 14. Something like that, okay. 15. So now you had to be laid up for a while after that. Actually, uh, um, I never, well, I, the next day I would have probably could have flown. We, we got, went out of the South China Sea and we ran into a few, a few uh, airplanes that day. And uh, I think they shot down half a dozen or so. 
You mean your flight shot down? The, our, our squadron. Your squadron, okay. And and then we went back to Ulithi, the Ulithi Hopped Hall, which was our R&R &R place. And we were there for about uh, two weeks. And we came out and I flew, the, I flew that day. So you, you were laid up for two and a half weeks or so? Yeah. Okay, so that would be, that would take you to... Our next... Beginning, our next, of, Fe beginning of February, middle of February, something like that? Our next uh, um, combat mission was when our, our raids on Tokyo in that area. Okay, so, so uh, okay, I, I don't really, I don't know enough about the Pacific War. Unfortunately. Well, that was the middle, middle of uh, February. I think the 14th and 15th we went in there. So then you sailed to Ulithi, and then you sailed north up to, off of Japan somewhere. Yeah. So was this to escort to B-29s, or? No. No, we were making our own raids. Uh, the first day we were in there, I was on a 40-plane uh, fire sweep. We had 20, 20 uh, Corsairs from the Bunker Hill. Bunker Hill had come back from its repairs and had rejoined us. And, <coughs> and we had 20 Hellcats from our squadron. Well, I was leading our 20 airplanes. <coughs> we had to go through an overcast to get get on top. And I, I brought the 20 airplanes in and just sat right underneath the tail end of, the, of his 20 and we went up. Well, our scheduled officer, Charlie, was flying the second division of, of Hellcats. He got lost. He, we got up, got up on top of the overcast. I look around. I've got four Hellcats. The other sixteen are gone someplace else. Well, didn't you have a breakaway procedure if you lost contact, turn away fifteen degrees, and level off, or procedures uh, like that? I mean, yeah. So, but there was no no excuse for him getting lost. Hell. All you had to do was do like I did, get right underneath these people and fly formation. Yeah, well, I don't know. Having flown in Germany for four years, <laughs> we got awfully black in some of those clouds. We did have those situations. You know, we had the wingtip about that far away from your canopy because you still couldn't see it was so dark inside. I don't know what it's like in Southeast Asia, in the South Pacific. Well, uh, I was able to fly with this guy, uh, the leader, and... Uh, Charlie, I don't know what Charlie did or where he went or anything. We got in there and we went to, our target was an airfield at Hamamatsu, which was on the coast maybe 40, 50 miles uh, west of Tokyo. And got in there and uh, he's, he had two photo planes with him. And he called me and he says, you stay up here and and escort the two photo planes. I'll take my rest of my group down and we'll beat up the airfield. Well, that wasn't exactly what I had in mind, but I said, well, okay. And so they started peeling off. Oh, God. And I look down the airfield and I see this twin engine bomber take off. And another one took off. And I thought, oh man, I'd like to go get those. And, and uh, those guys, they, they'll, they'll, they'll see them. They're all, they're all in the dive going down. Apparently, they never did see them. I watched them go out, saw the leader turn, come back. The other guy got inside and joined on him. And finally, they were going by a few miles to the to the north of, of the airfield, and I couldn't stand it any longer. I, I called my 
my second section leader, and I said, Lou, you, you and KK stay up here and, and uh, guard these two photos. I said, I'll be right back. So I <laughs> peeled off. We were 18,000 feet. Peeled off, and these two birds are down here, well, probably about 2,500 feet, I guess. And I came screaming out, I'm doing, I'm doing better than 400 knots, and, and which is just about max speed you can even maneuver that, that Hellcat at. Pulled up, gave a little lead, and, and, and a 90 degree shot, and I opened up and let out, and wasn't not too long a burst at all. He just exploded, just in a little tiny pieces. Was it a Betty bomber? It was a, uh, it was a, it was a Sally, twin engine Sally. And I passed underneath the other one, and I thought, well, I'm going so fast. The easiest way for me to get back on this other guy is just go pull ahead of him and just do a loop, go in and then do a, an overhead run on him, which I did. And I, I set him on fire, and I was still going pretty fast. I chopped all the throttle off and passed underneath him and pulled up alongside this way and, and flew formation on him a while and, and settled down and, and just watched him burn. And he was, the, the cockpit was just completely in flame. And, and all of a sudden, the, the emergency hatch came open. Flames had billowed out of the cockpit. And people started jumping out. Three of them jumped up. They didn't have any parachutes. They, I watched them, all three of them hit the ground. And this one went, went into a glide and he hit the ground over here couple of miles away. But kind of felt sorry for those guys. They, I guess they, they figured they'd rather rather jump to their death than burn to death. So that so that's now that's four in the Pacific. Well yeah but I uh, I gave I let my women have credit for one of those. No, no, it's just I'm reading this I don't know where I got this from but it says February 17th, in action against enemy forces in Tokyo area while protecting friendly bomber planes attacking heavily defended aircraft engine factories. Yeah, that was the next day. Okay. <clears throat> the next day we went in and I'd, I'd never seen a formation this big before. You know, we had 16 carriers in the Task Force 58. And the, uh, you never seen so many of our planes or their planes. Ours. Yeah. We had, well, each each of the big carriers like Essex, Bunker Hill, and that size carried a little over a hundred airplanes, 105, 110. And they kept maybe 20 fighters or so from each carrier. Well, not the not the, the smaller ones, but because um, they, they, they didn't carry that many. But they kept a good reserve of fighters back to fly combat air patrol. How far were the carriers off the coast of Japan? Oh, uh, I think, I'm, I'm not really sure, but it took us quite a while to get in there, and I would, I would say, uh, to our landfall was probably um, oh, at least 80 miles. So then you'd have a, a prearranged bingo fuel and all that sort of thing, or or was that the was that the term they used at that time? No, we didn't have any any emergency fuels at all. Well, I mean, I, I mean, when you know when you had to go back, when you had to. Like a thousand pounds of gas left, or something oh, like that. 
I mean, did they even call it bingo in those days? No. They didn't. No, we, we just uh, hoped we had enough to get back. <coughs> I was just I was just reading something the other day about some English pilots and they were, you know, the air traffic control or the, this is during the Battle of Britain and, and whoever wrote the book did a really good job and he, talked about, you know, they told him to push up, buster he said which was the term we used for, you know, you got to get there in a hurry, push it up, you know, buster. Yeah, buster was full throttle. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> but no bingo. <coughs> no, <coughs> we didn't we didn't use bingo. Uh, we went in there anyway, we, and we, of course we split up as we hit the coast. All the different areas group had a different target. And we had a Mitsubishi plant just, uh, just northwest of Tokyo. <coughs> we didn't have any bombers on board. We didn't have any dive bombers. They kicked all our dive bombers off in November. So all you're going to do is just shoot it up, just shoot the place up with, with machine gun bullets. Well, I mean, I realize they brought, they brought two Marine squadrons aboard, two Marine F four U squadron, of course, sir. Right. So, and, and we, they build us up. They kick the bombers off first, and then they build us up from thirty six airplanes to seventy two airplanes in one squadron. Ninety. 92 or 93 pilots, and <clears throat> a lot of them were these were these bomber pilots from the bomber squadron that we kicked off, sent to Guam. And they had extra pilots we put in our squadron and and tried to make fighter pilots out of them. <laughs> Charlie would be. I, I, I detect a little bit of sarcasm there. <laughs> and I say Charlie was one of them. And, and, uh, <clears throat> but so let's stop right there. Okay, now what makes a good fighter pilot versus a bomber pilot? When you talk bomber, you mean SBD type? Yeah. Dive bomber. Okay. All right. Well, well, it starts back in training. You you, you get a, a different a different outlook on life. Uh, the dive bombers are going in and they're they're they practice dive bombing and cooling down there like this and and drop the bomb and get the hell out of there and head for home. And uh, the fighters normally in the same situation are, are up there looking for enemy fighters to shoot at. And you know, these guys find a dive bombers and very, very little air-to-air -air gunner training. And, uh, well, I, I interviewed Jerry Coleman a few months ago, and uh, he flew SBDs and uh, off of Guadalcanal later in the war, probably about the same time you were there. Maybe, actually, probably a little before you were there. And he said they were only doing 100 knots going out to the to the target. Oh, yeah. You, you can't do a heck of a lot at 100 knots. No, no. <laughs> and in the dive, he said they were... They were probably 250 to 270, and he said he forgot to put his dive flaps down. He said he was probably doing 350 to 400 when he pulled out, but <laughs> he probably overstressed the heck out of that one. Yeah, the, they'd uh, they'd come down at about two. If, they're, if they were coming straight down, when their dive breaks out, they'd, they'd get about 270. Yeah. And I picked out a spot on that aircraft factory and finally pickled my bomb and got down right on the deck. <clears throat> we had an escape route out of there where we mapped out for us and I'm following this route out and and I I looked over and saw this Jap fighter over here a couple miles away right on the deck, it was a, it was a tojo, and uh, I had never seen a tojo before, and uh, I thought I was going to have a, a closer look, so I pulled up and I, I made a run on him, 
and he wasn't going very fast. And I, I hit him, I saw pieces fly off the, off the airplane, and I went by him, and him another, another, and I was doing this, and he, 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 he wouldn't flame, and he wouldn't smoke, but it had pieces coming off the damned airplane. Was it a radial motor or in line? Mm -hmm. Was it a radial motor in the, in the airplane? Yeah. And, and it, I, I, but he kept slowing down. And I knew he was in trouble. But he just kept flying and he must have flown 20 or 30 miles, turned and went over this little village. We went right down the main street of that village. And I'm shooting at him the whole time, and, and I'm, I'm making passes, but I didn't want to slow down, because if I got jumped, and I, yeah. well, I wanted to have all the speed I could get. Where's your wingman? I have no idea. He was behind me someplace in the dive. And he probably went the heck with this. <laughs> he, well, he, he said he saw this. This one that I shot at, right. he said he saw that crash. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, anyway, I chased this guy and finally came to a little gully. It wasn't very deep, maybe a hundred feet, four or five hundred feet wide. And he ducked down in there, and I, I think he probably went good, wanted to pick up a little speed. And I made a final pass at him, and, and then he tried to get out of there, and he, he never made it. He crashed into the side of the, oh, oh. the gully. So there I was, all by myself, over in the middle of Japan somewhere. <laughs> I, had, I had no <laughs> idea. Well, I knew partly because I could see the some of the tall buildings over yeah. there in Tokyo. And, you know, I, I headed out. And, Finally got back to the ship, but uh, and, uh, I, so that's I, now you're up to six. I got yeah, except that I gave that one right away to my wingman. Right, right. So I, I really, I, re, I really shot down seven of those birds out there, and I gave away two. So if you started off, you said you had about six hundred rounds to start off with, in a, in a what did we have? We have, oh no, we had more like 1,200 rounds. Does the wingman usually come back with more rounds of ammunition than the than the lead? Oh, I think probably. And less gas. <laughs> no doubt. I have one, one flight that was kind of interesting, a fighter sweep. We had 80, 80 Hellcats. Led by another group commander. How much did Hellcat cost? Any idea? Yeah, they were about fifty thousand. And they had uh, they made what ten thousand, eleven thousand. But there's one fighter sweep I got to tell you about. Eighty planes. We're the last twenty. We had four carriers with twenty, twenty Hellcats each. How do you how do you stop right there for a second? How far are the carriers apart? Carriers? Yeah. Oh, well, they're, they're in task groups. Each task group had four carriers. You had here, these two, uh, maybe um, maybe <coughs> 2,000 yards. Oh, close. Okay. So then how did you, so everybody's launching. They launch an airplane every 30 seconds or so? Twenty. And so then, how how do you reach? How do you join? You just circle. Well, you, 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 they give you a rendezvous areas, and you take off and head for your rendezvous areas. So when you take off with your flight as a flight lead, then what do you do? Do you just go straight ahead and make a left hand turn and guys join on you one two three four? Yeah. Pretty much, huh? And then you go to the assigned area and you join up. Yeah, and then join up with the rest of them. And then you and then fly into the target. You're, so you're 80, 90 miles off the coast. So you're going to fly to your target, and you go as basically as one big mass of eighty airplanes. Yeah, we had eighty birds 
optimistic. We were the last 20. What altitude were you going in? We were at about 18,000. Did the Japanese have radar? Yes, I think they did. So with a formation that big, they must have sent up some adversaries. We didn't see a thing. We came in over Luzon, looked down, and was completely fogged in the whole damn... Uh, Luzon, that's the Philippines, though, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so this was later in the war? No, this was... Uh, Early, okay. This was a little bit earlier. Okay. And this was in December, as a matter of fact, forty four. And the, uh, we got in there and this, this group commander who was leading us called up and he says, well, he says, it looks like we're going to have to scrub this mission. We can't, can't get in through that, through that overcast. And I said, uh, I'd been in there quite a few times in that area. And we were just passing a, a volcanic mountain out there in the middle of Luzon. It goes up about, oh, I don't know, 1,500, maybe 2,000 feet, I'm not sure. <clears throat> it's called Mount Ariat. In a little village here called Ariat. Well, I had noticed that from Clark Field, directly over Clark, pointing at that Mount area, was a heading of 090. And I said, if I can get under there, I know I can find Clark. So I called. Well, what was, it, was it called Clark at that time? Well, that's, what, yeah. that's what we call it now. Yeah, but did yeah. they call it Clark then? Yeah. Well, I guess they took it from us, didn't they? That's right. So, um, I called up and I said, Hey, uh, I've got a hole in sight. And uh, this, I didn't identify myself. And this guy said, Whoever said that, take the lead and lead us through it. I said, Okay, I'm breaking off to the right. I'm rocking my wings, turn around, and I fall in. And I went around. I was flying with the second section on my, my CO. And so I took the lead, and he's following me. And we get around here and turn. Uh, I go out to the east of Mount Ariat. And come back on a heading of 270. And when I come over that, we were at 18,000. And I, I pushed over, to go right over, right over the mountain. <coughs> Hit that overcast um, at about, I think it was around 1,200 feet or so. And I'm going like right hell, about 400 knots. <laughs> But 800 feet, I thought, I'll start leveling out a little bit and slow this rate of descent. And about 600 feet, I, a little bit more, and finally, and I kept letting on down. And about 200 feet, I broke out. And I'm still going about 400 knots. Now, so, so how many guys followed you down? I don't know. I wouldn't think it'd be very darn many. They probably said that guy's crazy. I was so, I was. How, by, by I, the way, how did I, you set your alt? How, how did you set your altimeter? I just. I mean, it, 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 here's what I had. Well, I mean, did, did they give you an estimate of what the altimeter said it would be no, over the island? No. No, it was, wasn't that far away. It went down 150, 200 miles. Yeah, but that could be. Fifty feet can make a big difference. <laughs> well, in those days, we didn't know anything about altimeter settings. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> we didn't pay attention. So anyway, I'm flying about twenty-five feet off the ground, and and 
you're still going like hell. But why going so fast? Why were you going so fast? Because I came down in that dive. But did you pull the power pole back on the way on the way down? Uh, no, I left it at a normal cruise. Kind of, By the way, did you I have to fully? I didn't want. I didn't want to have people, you know, going by me. Or, well, yeah. You know. Yeah. Okay. And so, I leveled out and had her on two seven zero and I'm going around. And I, I, one thing I didn't know for sure was how far it was. I thought maybe 40 miles, maybe 50 miles, maybe 60 miles. I wasn't sure. And so I, I'd have to pull up once in a while and go over a few trees. And, and <laughs> I went in and, and, and I didn't dare look around. I was flying so low. I, I didn't dare you know, look around and see how many planes I had with me. And I, 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 once in a while I, I could go like this. My guess is zero. And I could catch, <laughs> I, I caught two out here. Oh really? Wow. Which was my, my CO and his wingman and and my wingman over here and and I couldn't tell what was behind me. And I think I had quite a few. But I'm just leveled out and going along feeling, feeling real, real smart, you know, or a lieutenant, and I just get a I get a phone call, a radio call. It's this group commander, and he he seems like he's a little irate. <laughs> he says, "You son of a bitch!" <laughs> he says, "You didn't have a hole in sight," and I said, "Oh, it must have closed up on us." I said. We're underneath it anyway. And I said, Clark Field is 12 o'clock. And so we kept going and going and going and going. And I was beginning to doubt myself. And <laughs> God, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm screwed up here. And all of a sudden, I hit that east-west runway right on the nose, right down the middle of it. There it is right in front of me. Fly down the runway, I'm looking around, no damned airplanes to shoot at. And so finally I, I went I went down as low as I could get about five feet off the ground. And I could the north side up there of Clark had a big grove of trees that you couldn't see down in between but you know, Oh right, right, right. Underneath through them. But underneath God, underneath those trees, here's a Looks like a like a, a, a whole goddamn air force underneath there, and I thought, hot damn! And I got down to the end of the runway, and I turned around, came back, and and lined up right on the deck, and just started shooting underneath those trees, and got over there and went on the other side and turned around. Came back and did it again and again and again. Finally, on the next pass, going down there, we've got some fires going in there. Oh, I found out after the first pass, and I turned around, there was only two of us, my wingman and I. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody else, apparently, whoever there were, uh, when, I, when I made that first turn, they just pulled up and went back up and went home. And, so, Exercising discretion. I came down <laughs> this last pass and, and all of a sudden, pow, 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 I got three bullets right in my the bulletproof glass right in front of my Oh, my wow. Bullets. And it had to have been 30 caliber because they didn't come through, but it sure raised hell with the, with yeah. the windshield. And, the same time, my wingman called me and he says, Diz, I'm hit. Oh, boy. And I, he's right over here. I looked over at him and, God, he's got smoke just pouring out of that thing. Smoke and oil pouring out of that engine. I said, okay, Randy, let's go up. And the little bag and stick and popped up on top. And by the time we got on top, he had quit smoking. It's because he was all out of oil. Yeah. And I, I said, okay, Randy, you take the lead. 
Set your power at 30 and 20. 30 inches, 2,000 RPM. And then I'll fly, fly, I'll fly your, your wing and I'll give you vectors to get us home. Well, we were 250 miles from, from the fleet. And uh, I didn't know if, if the engine would keep, keep running or not. But we had found out one thing that that R 2800, if you were out of oil, if you set your power and never touched it, that it would run and run and run and run. So, um, went out, I picked up the YE and got a heading, and, and finally we got in, and there was the Essex right in front of us, and I, I said, Randy, take it on in. I said, take it straight in and don't, don't, uh, don't touch the power unless until you absolutely have to. So he went in and landed. And I came around and I landed. And I thought I'd probably get court-martialed, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't give me any medal either. <laughs> That is funny. Poor old Randy. How about do some comparing? Did you ever fly any of the German or Japanese airplanes? <clears throat> no. Not real ones. Not real ones? You mean you flew some? Oh, well, they only get Tora, Tora, Tora. Why don't you tell us about Tora, Tora, Tora? Wait, before we do that, I want you, I want you to do some comparing. Compare for me. You flew a Corsair, I'm sure, right? Oh, yeah. And you flew the Bearcat. Yeah. Of all those, the Wildcat, Hellcat, Corsair, and Bearcat, which was the best one of those airplanes, in your estimation? Well, I think if I were going to go to war, I'd like to be in the Bearcat. And the reason why? You know, speed, maneuverability. How much more speed? I mean, it had, basically it had the same engine as the Hellcat. It was a 2800, right? Yeah. But what's why was this? It had pretty short wings, I remember that. Well, it was also about 3,000 pounds lighter. Oh, that'll do it. Yeah. But you flew the Hellcat in uh, after the war, and you were in some unit you were in for a couple of years, right? I flew the... I, I, I mean the Bearcat, I mean the Bearcat. Yeah, I flew the Bearcat in, in two, two outfits. But they it never actually entered the war. They were just getting it ready at the end of the war, right? Yeah, they never got out. How many, 